for Jason Kim. Um, Dr. Kim is right now a full professor uh, at UMass and also running the one of the few, I think only three or four, five, wow. That's a, yeah. One of the NIH sponsored mouse phenotype center, which is very competitive. Um, I know, I know Dr. Kim um, has many things to, to, to share with us. Uh, one thing, if you work with metabolic disease, if you don't know Dr. Kim, that means you have not been in the field of metabolic <laughs> research because Dr. Kim collaborated with uh, half of the world, I think. <laughs> so it'd be rare you don't see him. Uh, in many of the events, and he's uh, almost like a celebrity, actually. Um, he's very productive, very proliferative. He has published over 150 papers, and many of them in high-quality journal. He's one of the leading figures in um, uh, uh, inflammation and, and uh, insulin resistance. Um, actually, Dr. Kim pioneered the one of the uh, muscle perfusion technique, uh, still used uh, uh, you know, nationwide by many labs. Um, so I also know Dr. Kim personally because we shared overlapped with my career <laughs> at Penn State. Um, I have a joke to make about Dr. Kim. Dr. Kim is a true lover of uh, opera. So when he first joined Penn State, um, he was occupy our chair's office, Dr. Jim Jefferson's office, the big office. office. Yeah, the old office. Old so, and uh, Dr. Jefferson has a few uh, administrative staff. They were outside the office. Um, so Dr. Kim listened uh, opera, you, you know, whenever he got a few minutes time. And the um, administrative assistant started talking to Dr. Kim, uh, Dr. Jefferson, who is the chairman, said, I hear Dr. Kim's office have somebody crying all the time. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, that's how <laughs> I hear that joke. Uh, anyway, um, it's really a, a pleasure. He's going to talk about chocolate because he spent a few years at Hershey, which is a chocolate town. Hopefully he'll give us something very sweet. Welcome. <clears throat> oh, yes, I should actually put this on. Um, that's such a nice introduction. Thank you, Roger. I'm very Humble by that, you know. I mean, I do listen to some happy operas too, by the way. <laughs> One of my favorite being Don Giovanni, which is um, all about happiness, right? <laughs> anyway, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be here. I, is it okay now? Great. Um, I have so many colleagues here, uh, from Musi uh, to, to my good friend and colleague, Roger, and my old friend, Fangs, over there, really. So I know so many people here, so I know this visit is long overdue. It's great to be here. San Antonio is a great city. Um, I've always heard it's a buggy city, but I don't know. I haven't seen any bugs. Um, but it's certainly beautiful weather. So thanks for the invitation. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I'm here to tell you a little bit about, I guess, macrophage and microbiome, uh, what I call the M&Ms of type 2 diabetes. Uh, we've done a lot of recent work uh, with macrophages. Microbiome is just going to take up maybe just the last about five minutes. It's something that we're starting to dabble kind of into as what many investigators are doing it because it's one of those kind of a catchphrase that is hard to be without. And, and certainly uh, when you're actively uh, running a program, you kind of have to always follow that trend. And trend is an important thing in science. But anyway, so it's nice to be here. So I'm going to start with perhaps uh, good news and bad news. And I'll start with the bad news first. There are 425 million uh, adults have diabetes. Um, it's a truly a global uh, issue. There isn't a country that is exempt or immune from this epidemic. And another interesting statistic and remarkable is that the top three countries that are leading and kind of something that you're not so proud of, but the China, India, and USA make up more than half of that population. So it certainly is a serious issue globally. And it keeps us working hard for that reason. Now, this is a familiar face to all, I'm sure. It's one of my favorite actors. This is uh, right? Tom Hanks, right? 
Do you guys all remember this uh, scene? It's that famous scene where he sits uh, on a bench and talks about his amazing life, ordinary to him, but extraordinary to others. And he talks about how life is like a box of chocolate. So there's my chocolate line. <laughs> now, that's back in 1994. Um, this is about 20 years later. And you can see probably ate a lot of chocolate too, but you can see the obvious, put on some weight. And it came out in the David Letterman show in 2013 to make a public announcement about how he has type 2 diabetes. But it's not so much about the fact that he has diabetes that I'm showing you this. Uh, and this is where the bad turns to good news. When David Letterman showed quite concern during the show and express, you know, a lot of worries. But, you know, what are you going to do? How is it going to affect you? Are, are you going to be okay? Tom was smiling throughout the entire interview, the entire uh, show. And, and he casually said today, no worries, type 2 diabetes is controllable. You've just got to lose weight and exercise a lot and change everything you eat, which is absolutely true. It is a manageable disease. He certainly had a good, good endocrinologist. It really taught him very well. It is a well-known fact that you don't have to lose all that weight. All it takes is losing 5 to 7% of body weight, and that is known to prevent or delay the onset of diabetes. And for that reason, for all practicing diabetologists, that really should be the, the first regimen that you should speak to your patients about, just changing your lifestyle before relying on pharmacological regimen. So that's the good news. A map that I'm sure you've seen many times um, is back in 1991, where most of the country had obesity rate uh, below 10 or 10 percent. So not really epidemic at that time. And of course, you've seen the trend about 20 years later, and now about half of the country is now about 30 percent or more. What's concerning is that despite our efforts to try to campaign the importance of obesity with relation to many of our diseases, anything from diabetes to, to cardiovascular diseases and CNS disorders, I don't think there's any sign that this trend is changing. As the latest statistic tells us, now more than a third of adults are obese. And if this trend continues by year 2030, which is not too far from now, we may have half of the American adults be obese. And that's, that's significant. That's very significant. So lots to do. Or becoming obese. How we maintain weight is a simple law of thermodynamics. It's basically energy in minus energy out, and that's our weight. So if you think about how we eat more than ever before, and how we are less active than ever before, it's easy to see how our weight has increased. And has anyone seen this movie called The Super Size Me? It's a great movie. It's, it's, you know, anybody wants to believe about how we are what we eat, uh, you should see that movie. And it's a movie about uh, this gentleman here who was relatively healthy, goes on, Initial mission was to go on a four-week binge eating of McDonald's, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But he actually had to stop this three weeks into his own self-study because he was getting really, really sick. His blood pressure is risen. You know, he was showing all the signs of prediabetes. So really, it's, it's about what we eat, and it's also about what we are putting into our body. And I think some of the things that Many of us, uh, well, not us here, but many people eat. I think we have to redefine the word food. It's just really troublesome uh, of what's really out there. And not only that, how we and how especially our children are often found in home. They're not playing outside, even though we're supposed to be an outdoor species of running around, roaming around the world. Uh, but that inactivity is also a big into this. So does this all mean that this is a, a modern phenomenon, just a modern disease? I guess it depends on how you define modern. There is a very famous painting uh, by Jacques-Louis David, Coronation of Napoleon. And if you kind of look at this individual right there, 
You can see it doesn't look quite lean or healthy. It's quite large. Um, and there's no doubt during the ceremony, he was thinking about where he's going to be afterwards. So obesity has been around. We're talking about maybe last hundreds of years. It's, it's not something just now. But certainly we know a lot more about obesity now than ever before. You've seen the obesity map. Now here is the diabetes map over the exact same duration. And you can see the amazing parallel between the obesity and diabetes prevalence in the US. And this is no accident because what we now know is that obesity is the lead engine of this progressive chronic disease known as diabetes, type 2 diabetes, which obesity causes insulin resistance. And the insulin resistance is one of the major early and a requisite event that leads to these other effects in pancreas and our peripheral organs that leads to type 2 diabetes. And if you don't control your blood glucose, then you have complications that begin affecting other organs of our body. So there's no doubt obesity is a major cause of the disease. And the question is, how does obesity affect insulin resistance? And this is where, over the past decades, there have been many paradigms. Um, and the one paradigm that we've taken particular interest, going back about the last 15 years, is how inflammation is tied to type 2 diabetes. And this notion, at least for us, kind of curiosity, began uh, back in uh, 1997, uh, coming across this paper from John Pickup's group. This was more or less kind of a, kind of almost like a case study where he happened to observe that if you look for circulating cytokines, in obese diabetic subjects, but they tend to be about three, four times higher than non-diabetic subjects. And again, this was really more of an observation, noting that circulating levels of inflammatory cytokines are higher than those who are non-diabetic. So upon reading that paper and taking an interest in that, uh, one of the first study, once I began setting up my own lab at Yale, uh, Hyo Jung Kim was a postdoc in the lab, and she's now a professor at Ochi University School of Medicine in Korea. What we decided to do is one of the two cytokines that Pickup reported to be elevated were IL-6, and we wanted to see whether this IL-6 had any relevance to insulin resistance. We wanted to see whether IL-6, if you infuse IL-6 acutely into healthy, lean, normal mice, does it affect metabolism? And here you can see from the data, that it does, that shortly uh, only four hour IL-6 infusion to raise circulating IL-6 level, you can see that all of a sudden muscle uses less glucose and hepatic insulin action is down by 50%. So you can artificially create insulin resistance in lean animals by simply raising IL-6 level. I also found out that how it does is that IL-6 activates STAT3, SOX3 signaling, and the increase in SOX3 is a protein that's known to target insulin signaling proteins such as IRS protein or ubiquitinated degradation. So it blocks the insulin signaling, and that certainly is one mechanism by which IL-6 can downregulate insulin signaling and therefore insulin action. And then about the same time, Tony Ferrante's group at Columbia identified that these cytokines that are detected to be elevated in diabetic subjects, IL-6, TNF-alpha, they're not only produced by the immune cells, but they're actually produced by the, the adipocytes uh, where the adipose tissue in obese individuals are kind of infiltrated by these macrophages, and that leads to a massive adipose inflammation. And this is where really the birth of the adipose inflammation kind of began and, and, and taken shape. What we now know is that the inflammation isn't just restricted to the adipose tissue, that if you look at it, whether obese human subjects or obese animal models, inflammation is seen in multiple organs, uh, such as skeletal muscle, liver, as well as adipose tissue. Inflammation is also seen uh, in pancreas, in brain, in heart. So we're talking about really a systemic inflammation 
that, uh, that exhibits uh, when you become obese. Now, what that means is that type 2 diabetes is just as much an inflammatory disease. And if type 2 diabetes is an inflammatory disease, then if you treat the inflammation, can you perhaps treat the diabetes? Now, that's a very logical question. In fact, that question was asked of more than 100 years ago. Here's uh, Robert Williamson uh, published, a, again, a case study that long ago in British Medical Journal. You know, back then, this was all about case study because there's very little evidence base with very little to do technically. And what he came across, and the title of this study is the, uh, on the treatment of glycosuria and diabetes mellitus with sodium salicylate. So he was, as an internist, he was treating his patients elderly subjects, uh, with a high-dose salicylate for the rheum uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which works beautifully to control the inflammation. But it turned out that many of those patients also had type 2 diabetes, because many of them were elderly subjects. And what he accidentally found is that the high-dose salicylate that he was treating with also improved their diabetes condition. And he went on to say in this article, recently I've ende endeavored to ascertain whether sodium salicylate has any definite influence on the sugar excretion in glycosuria and diabetes. So this was observed that far ago. And it was ironic that exactly 100 years from that time period, that working uh, as a postdoc working in Jerry Schumann's lab uh, and working with Steve Schulzen's group at Jocelyn, uh, that we demonstrated that if you treat diabetic subjects or diabetic animal and diabetic animal models, with high dose salicylate that you can improve their diabetic condition. You can prevent fat induced insulin resistance. And in fact, in that case, it does represent potentially a, an important class of therapeutic agents to treat type 2 diabetes. But having said that, of course, we know the limitation of salicylate. It does have a lot of side effect, especially at the high dose. It has massive side effect, especially affecting the gut. So what I began to do about that time is, what can I find that can kind of promote the anti-inflammatory effects that can be uh, observed or that can be attained from endogenous factors? So there we began the interesting kind of path and journey of looking at the interleukin-10. IO-10 is a major anti-inflammatory cytokine that our cells produce. And, and it really has some very potent anti-inflammatory effects. And at the time, uh, when I was at Yale, Ung Kyung Hong was uh, another postdoc in the lab, and she's now the chief of endo at Harlem University College of Medicine. Uh, we made a transgenic mouse model that overexpresses IL-10 in skeletal muscle. So I'm going to label them as an MIL-10 mice uh, going forward. These mice are born normally. Uh, there's not much going on when the animals are on, on, on chow diet. Again, you wouldn't expect anything because IL-10 was selectively expressed in skeletal muscle. So in Sezin, Dr. Deverin, who was a PhD student in the lab, she's now doing a postdoc at Harvard Richard Lee's lab. Uh, she decided to challenge these mice with a chronic high-fat feeding. She fed these mice for 16 weeks of high-fat diet. And here you can see that it doesn't affect obesity. Uh, both wild-type animals and the IL-10 expressing mice, they both become obese about to a comparable degree. Again, you wouldn't expect any effect there because this is a muscle selective expression of IL-10. But despite the fact that the animals became comparably obese to the wild-type, there was a traumatic effect on glucose metabolism. Here you can see how the wild-type animals, after 16 weeks of IFF feeding, uses less glucose, uh, and then the IL-10 mice that had improved glucose metabolism. Now here, I should point out, of course, uh, you know, we did so-called a CLAM study, and I should certainly note, just in case someone actually doesn't know, that this is actually the birthplace of the CLAM. I mean, Roger actually gave me, you know, credit about doing the work in mice, but this is really where the CLAM began with Rob Tefrando's work and you guys' work uh, with humans. So this, you know, that's why I privilege really be here uh, with my background. But anyway, so the IL-10, despite being equally obese, had a, had a show to improve insulin sensitivity. And most of it is coming from the muscle. So the muscles of these mice had increased glucose uptake. And then we look for inflammation. 
So here you can see that after 16 weeks of high-fat feeding, the wild-type animal, we see this, this increased inflammatory cytokines in skeletal muscle. This is a local skeletal muscle levels of interferon gamma, IL-6, and IL-1-alpha. All of those are increased about two to four-fold. But in the IL-10 mice, there's a complete suppression of this obesity-mediated inflammatory response in skeletal muscle. And that certainly is what we believe is, is the reason that the muscle remains insulin sensitive in these mice. Now, I am at the Aging Institute or invited by the Aging Institute, so I have to at least talk something about the aging and show you some data that we have on, on this aging project. And of course, here, everybody, you're the expert here, you know, insulin resistance is also a major characteristic of aging. So Sezen took these IL-10 mice and was interested in how about against the aging associated insulin resistance? How do these mice do? So she decided to keep these mice around longer, which is certainly to a PI is always a nightmare when the mice have to stay as long as 18 months of age. So how much you have to feed more and, and, and spend more. So if you look at the wild type and the IL-10 mice, uh, and she kept up to 18 months or beyond, not a whole lot of difference when it comes to body weight or adiposity. If anything, uh, there's a slight trend of the IL-10 mice uh, weighing a little bit more and having a little bit more fat mass, but, but nothing dramatic uh, to write home about. But there were dramatic changes in, in, in energy balance, which is kind of interesting. So we uh, performed our metabolic case study to look at energy expenditure. And what we found first in the wild type animals that the energy expenditure stays fairly uh, flat or fairly uh, constant up to about 16 months of age, and then it, it declines after that. So it seems like the aging effect on energy expenditure kind of starts to kick in after 16 months of age. What's remarkable is that the IO-10 mice showed higher energy expenditure. And this decline after 16 months of age was also somewhat blunted in these mice. We saw the similar change in physical activity, which showed uh, this declining trend uh, after about a year of age in the wild type mice. But here you can see that the IL-10 expression mice were somewhat resistant to this aging mediated effect or loss of activity. There were more changes in metabolism. And here you can see compared to the aging wild type mice, I believe these were uh, one and a half year old mice, both groups. The aging IL-10 mice were more insulin sensitive, they had more glucose infusion rate during the clamp, higher glucose turnover, and they had more glycogen synthesis. So they were more insulin sensitive at 18 months of age compared to the wild type mice. And again, a lot of the effect was directed to skeletal muscle, they used more glucose. We also saw more insulin signaling in regards to uh, phosphate AKT activity was higher in the IL-10 mice. Is this all due to perhaps also the IL-10's effect on inflammation? Now, that's an obvious path because we've done a study with Angela Vervelde's group in Spain just a few years before then showing that with aging, there's also an adipose inflammation that settles in and that may partly contribute to insulin resistance. So we decided to look at the inflammation in muscle and we saw this dramatic reduction in CD68 uh, as a marker of macrophages, as well as cytokine. And we also saw at the protein level, we saw less IL-1 beta and less uh, chemokine MCP1 in the IL-10 expressing mice that were equally as old as the wild type mice. So based on all of that, uh, we believe that both obesity and aging are physiological states of low-grade systemic inflammation and perhaps metabolic disease then may be treated by targeting inflammation. It's still something that we are working on. Now, just switching the gear a little bit to nowadays our favorite cell type, and that is the macrophage. Now, I began my graduate training focusing on skeletal muscle, and that's been pretty much the organ that I've been most comfortable with. But nowadays, not having the immunology background has really been tough because I feel like day and night, all I talk about are macrophages and T cells and these other immune cells. And that's because that's where diabetes has led to. And this is where I, I usually talk to young students or trainees about how important it is as you go through graduate training and postdoc training is to engage yourself 
in the topic of learning that is different in so many ways. Because you just never know where science will be 10 years from now. So when we talk about macrophage, it certainly is an important cell type because we know that it orchestrates the obesity-mediated inflammation. So this is where we know macrophages do play an important role in insulin resistance because if you deplete the system of macrophages by using clodronate-containing liposomes, you treat the animals, and then you feed the high-fat diet to the animals, they get obese, and, but you block the inflammation. When you do that, the animals don't become insulin resistant. So we know macrophages are bad for metabolism, but getting rid of macrophage isn't a viable option of therapy because macrophages are needed for our immune system. But when I talk about colorful characters of macrophages, just as colorful as the M&Ms that you take out of that little bag, I'm referring to the polarization of the macrophages. And this is where the macrophage is quite interesting in that the, the one cell type can be either pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory, depending on which state it is polarized to, and that dictates uh, uh, what transcription factors they induce, uh, and then what cytokines are then released that, that has the inflammatory or anti-inflammatory effect. It's actually a perfect system that, that nature has, has kind of invented in us, because as much as we want these macrophages to, to elicit and promote inflammation when it detects any kind of a, of a foreign toxin in our body. Once the inflammation is, or once the toxins are clear, that we want these very active soldier and killer cells to kind of clear from the system, and the macrophages also help out in that manner by shutting down the inflammation. This is a very clever system, uh, one cell type, really having two faces. We know that this is the area that we can press manipulate because in our recent work with Roger Davis group on campus, we found out that this protein known as CGN kinase or junk can actually activate the macrophages to go into M1 polarization. And by doing so, it can regulate the obesity mediated inflammation and therefore insulin resistance. This is where we became interested in a protein called GRP78. Now, GRP78 was first discovered as a glucose regulator protein induced by glucose starvation. That's why it is glucose regulator protein, GRP78 kilodalton. That's where the name comes from. It shares 50% homology to the H-shock protein 70. And a lot of the effect that we see when we lower GRP78 is very similar to what happens when you tone down the H-shock protein that it tends to elevate other, other proteins that are involved in this network. It is a major chaperone in the ER with HPS activity. Uh, it responds to active protein folding. It promotes degradation of misfolded protein. It prevents protein aggregation. It is a calcium binding protein, and it regulates ER stress signaling. It is a major protein that is involved in what we call unfolded protein response, or UPR, which is our endogenous kind of protective mechanism to ER stress. And GRP7 is a major player in this by interacting physically with some of the major ER stress proteins, some of which were discovered here by, by Dr. Shi, PERC, ATF6, RA1. And by interacting with them, it is able to respond to ER stress, and it is meant to tone down the ER stress. So it is really our endogenous protective element to an ER stress and try to maintain the ER homeostasis. And having such role, we thought perhaps then, can GRP78 regulate this macrophage response in terms of the polarization or activation between the M1 and M2. Because after all, active macrophages are very uh, busy in making proteins, and there's no doubt an element of ER stress in the macrophages. So we hypothesize that GRP78 may mediate some of these effects. So Jong-un Kim, who was a postdoc at the time, he just became an assistant professor at Sungshin University in Korea. We decided to make, uh, using lysem cremize, 
a myeloid cell specific knockout of TRP78 using the flox mice we obtained from Amy Lee's lab at USC. And here you can see that it is not a complete knockdown. The TRP78 is reduced by about 70% looking at the peritoneal macrophages or bone marrow dry macrophages. So it's not a complete knockdown. And that probably explains why that it doesn't affect the integrity of the macrophages or the monocyte. So when we do a fact sorting, you can see that there are normal uh, level of macrophages and monocytes detected in spleen as well as peripheral and mesenteric lymph nodes. So we did not or we did not affect the macrophage cell population in these knockout animals. And of course, Jong Un then challenged these mice to a high fat diet because, under normal child condition, these animals really are not phenotypic. Um, they weigh normally, they're born normally, uh, metabolism is really unaltered. So, not a lot happening when the animals are in child diet. So, Jong Un then went on to put these mice on high fat diet. He fed them for about seven to about nine weeks, actually, for most of the data that follows. No change in obesity. Um, and I think this is important because. Previous model, the manipulated junk has actually shown some effects on obesity-induced or diet-induced obesity. But at least in our GRP78 knockdown in macrophages, there is no effect on obesity. Animals de uh, develop adiposity just like the wild-type mice. But there are certainly inflammatory effects. So when we look at the white adipose tissue, uh, looking at the macrophages using CD68 and F480 marker, you can see the dramatic reduction in adipose inflammation uh, in these GRP78 knockout mice. And of course, with that, you would suspect that these mice might, might be more insulin sensitive. That's exactly what we found. The GRP78 knockout mice, after IFF feeding, uh, really ha are just as insulin sensitive from skeletal muscle point of view as the, uh, the mice that are in child diet. So, by having less GRP78 in macrophages, uh, we're able to protect the animals from, from developing muscle insulin resistance. We see the same effect from on the insulin signaling. The IRS1 phosphorylation is, is much uh, uh, more normal, active in the knockout skeletal muscle as compared to the wild type muscle. Now, this is where it took a little surprising turn. So we thought then, when we look at skeletal muscle inflammation, the, the organ that we think uh, is directly responsible for glucose disposal and insulin action, we were initially surprised to find that there were more macrophages in muscle, not less. But it turns out that most of these macrophages that are in skeletal muscle were M2 polarized. You can see the reduced M1 markers, M2, and you can see the elevated IL-10 markers so these mice, the macrophages, have been polarized in M2 state, having less GRP78. What are some other effects that is surprising? So having the M2 polarization, if anything, we thought the IL-6 double be high, uh, would be lower, but exact opposite. We saw actually a dramatic increase in circulating IL-6 level. So this is where kind of how I define the colorful characters of macrophages. And I think from metabolism person's point of view that this is quite surprising and confusing. But if you take this data to immunologists, they will say there's nothing extraordinary about this. There is no M1 versus M2. There's a lot of things in between that often happens when you alter a certain aspect of macrophages. And it seems like there's something that is very selective to these macrophages that are lacking GRP78. And these IL-6, uh, we, we demonstrated they are coming from the macrophages. So if you take the bone marrow dry macrophages, we see the threefold elevated expression of the IL-6 mRNA. And if you actually uh, incubate them, that we do see more IL-6 being secreted by these macrophages. So they are coming from the macrophages that lack GRP78. So how is GRP78 or lack of GRP78 mediate this increased IL-6? Well, we came across a, a paper in diabetes from Iwasaki's group that show that ATF4 is known to activate IL-6 promoter in macrophages. So this is where we began then trying to characterize, well, what's really happening to our 
GRP-780 PC macrophages. So we did some very intense QRT-PCR and Western blot. And what we found is that these macrophages showed increased ATF-4, increased ATF-6A, splice XBP-1, and we also saw a huge increase in CRP-94. But the message and also the protein level, you can see the increase in CRP-94. So how do we explain all this? Now remember, CRP-78 is not completely null in these mice that this was toned down. We have seen in previous study with Amy Lee's group that if you take CRP-78 whole body heterozygous mice, one of the major phenotypes that was seen in adipocyte that lacked GRP78 by 50% was that there was a tremendous adaptive upregulation of other elements of the unfolded protein response that included GRP94 and others. And that's exactly uh, what we are also seeing in macrophages. By having less GRP78, the other elements of the UPR are now upregulated, sort of compensate and try to maintain the ER homeostasis. And that's exactly what we're seeing. And that increase in ATF4 seems to be the direct responsible for increased IL6 production and secretion in these mice. Another cytokine that was dramatically changed, it was IL13. It was increased by more than sevenfold in these uh, CRP78 knockout mice and macrophages. Now, IL13 is one cytokine that is largely produced by the TH17 cells, but we looked at them. There is no change or no significant change in TH17 cell population, so that does not seem to be the source of the IL13. And about that time, we came across a few papers uh, from Jeff Pessins and 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 uh, uh, Li group at Harvard that IL-13 is actually also a myokine that is produced by the skeletal muscle and has been shown to have some paracrine effects. So, so we looked at muscle, and that's exactly what we found. We found in skeletal muscle of these now felt mice, we saw more than five-fold increase in IL-13 expression. We also saw more than two-fold increase in IL-13 receptor expression. Now, this increase in IL-13 expression by the muscle and the increased IL-6 secretion by the macrophages. Now, are there any connection? Remember, earlier a few slides back that I've shown you that the skeletal muscle of these mice had increased macrophages going to. So what we then ask is that, well, can IL-6 actually promote IL-13 expression in muscle? And that's what we found from C2C12 cells, that IL-6 was able to be a potent induction of IL-13 and also the IL-13 receptor. So, with a limited time, without going through other data that were in, uh, in, the, in the paper, uh, what we kind of uh, found is that with activated UPR that is induced by reduced GRP78, appears to promote IL6 secretion, potentially through ATF4 signaling pathway. It converts or it polarizes uh, macrophages to an M2 state, but again, there is a selective secretion of IL6 which tends to be uh, stimulating the myocyte expression of IL-13, and that IL-13 seems to have an autocrine or paracrine effect to increase muscle glucose metabolism, where we have some data that have shown that. So in the last about, about five, uh, ten minutes, I'll talk about the microbes. Um, again, a topic that we began uh, our work, and uh, most of this is really preliminary. Now here, uh, by colorful world of gut microbes, I'm kind of referring to the, the importance of the microbial diversity that, that we know. And of course, we know one trend uh, that is quite uh, concerning is that over the years or the past century, if you look at some of these uh, statistics, especially in developed countries like U.S., the microbial diversity has been declining. So the obvious question is, what may contribute such declining trend of our gut microbial diversity. I think the one easy place to point finger will be the antibiotic. Now we know that there is a serious topic about the global overuse and misuse of antibiotic. And if you look at some of these numbers, it's staggering. Annually, we use more than 73 billion antibiotic doses worldwide, even in children. Usually by the age of two, 
a typical child gets three courses of antibiotic doses, and 11 by the age of 10. And in pregnancy, more than 50% are treated with antibiotic or given as prophylaxis. So antibiotic use has been quite rampant. Certainly is important for controlling whatever infection or inflammation, but I think one must not forget the consequence that antibiotic has in our gut microbe. To that end, an interesting map to share with you is this is the antibiotic prescription, kind of the prevalence map of the U.S. in 2015. And if this map from the coloration wise kind of has a similarity or it, it should because it's a lot like the obesity map that I showed you earlier in my talk. And this remarkable similarity perhaps may not be so accidental, and this is certainly a topic of interest to uh, an NYU investigator who leads in microbiome research, Martin Blazer, who uh, in the last about five, six years came up with some, some really series of nice papers that have shown that early life treatment with antibiotic has some lasting effect on metabolism and perhaps on obesity that we are seeing uh, that is growing in trend. His overall model is that, again, in early life, exposure to antibiotic changes the gut microbiota, reduces the diversity, and that has a long-term physiological changes. And, and that's something that we've taken also a lot of interest. And with that, uh, uh, Dr. Blazer's group and I, we, uh, be, uh, uh, we've been working on a, this collaboration project for the past about a year and a half, uh, where these are uh, normal mice. Uh, where these mice have been exposed to a low-dose penicillin, but not the actual mice that are shown in this data. The low-dose penicillin was given in drinking water to the mom during the first four weeks uh, before the mice were weaned. So the pups that are growing, that are shown in these two figures, have been exposed to antibiotic through the mom, is, is the actual study kind of a design. Uh, and what we have seen, you can see, uh, we follow from the weaning from four weeks of age, uh, and then the animals were first put on chow diet, and then at nine weeks of age, we begin the high fat feeding to see. And again, keep in mind that during this, this entire period, uh, these mice are not, are not exposed to uh, penicillin. But one thing that's dramatic is that studying at about five, about five weeks on a high-fat diet, you slowly begin to see this increase, this divergence of body weight, and you can see that a lot of it is coming from the fat man. So the fact that these mice, as pups, that were exposed to penicillin through mom's drinking water somehow appears to change their metabolism or energy balance, that these animals are becoming a little bit more obese. Using the metabolic cages, we found that one of the change is on physical activity. So if you look at the activity chart, uh, when the animals are weaned at four weeks of age, this is right at the end of that, that penicillin through drinking water, we already see the effect that it has taken on activity which is lower in these penicillin exposed mice compared to the controls. And even after uh, 16 weeks of IFET diet, we see lower physical activity in these mice. So again, interesting lasting effect that seems to settle in in these mice that is uh, very consistent with these animals becoming uh, modestly obese as the animals uh, are put on high fat diet the the oh yes oh that's the using metabolic cages which measures the light beam uh, when the mice move around and triggers right um, did the antibiotic uh, affect the microbiome diversity? It certainly does. 16S data showing you the altered community structure between the control groups and the penicillin treated groups. We see that at the end of the weaning or at the end of the penicillin uh, exposure, uh, which actually continues on into well into the animals having on a high fat diet. This is relative abundance in gut microbe at the final level. You can see already on day 28 that the penicillin exposure has really uh, separated their gut diversity and that continues to be the case uh, when the animals have been on high fat diet for 11 weeks. And again, this is something that is ongoing and we're building uh, more and more data to understand why uh, the metabol uh, metabolic changes are taking place. So I hope I've convinced all of you that 
these macrophages, the microbiome, appear to have colorful characters in kind of different facets. Uh, but all in all, there's no doubt that they play an important role in metabolic disease. So with that, um, this is our medical school in Worcester. We're about an hour west uh, of Boston. This is taken during the beautiful autumn. Uh, this is the new building that, uh, that we're in called the Albert Sherman Center that was built about, about five years ago now. Um, and uh, I want to thank my funding sources and, of course, our, uh, the MMPC that, uh, that I run and the other four centers are located in Michigan, uh, Cincinnati, uh, Vanderbilt, and UC Davis. And as a consortium, uh, our centers are basically uh, play an important role in sharing all of our expertise and resources with any investigators anywhere around the world. So if anybody has an interesting mouse, uh, I know there's a huge, powerful metabolism group here that I'm sure they can do most of your stuff, but if there's ever, you know, one thing that somehow they cannot do, uh, feel free to reach out to any of our MPCs. And um, again, I want to thank our, our good collaborator, Dr. Martin Blazer at NYU. He's got an interesting book called Missing Micro that's actually a, a really good read for anybody who wants to uh, spend some time reading or listening to some music. Uh, this is my lab. I want to thank uh, Sejin and Jonglun. Most of the data come from their three studies uh, and then other members of the lab as well as our collaborators. Thank you.